Welcome to the Ocular Surface Academy podcast, TFOS Dues 2 edition. Join us as we meet with the researchers behind this landmark international consensus. Each episode will feature practical clinical takeaways. Before we get to today's episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Hello, my name is Jack DeSange, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Medical Therapeutics here at Allegan and AbbVie Company. You've likely heard that AbbVie and Allegan have joined forces. We're very proud of the Allegan name and heritage, and we'll now be known as Allegan and AbbVie Company. We share a common goal of developing world-class products and solutions for patients, and it's been a seamless transition. AbbVie and Allegan share a common vision to act with integrity, to serve the community, to drive innovation, but also to embrace diversity and inclusion. Together, we're working to have a significant positive impact on eye care professionals and their patients. R&D will always remain one of our top priorities. Innovation is in our DNA. We're constantly looking for ways to transform ideas into new possibilities. We look for better pathways for disease treatment. Whether it's finding a new solution, a new formulation, or a new delivery method in glaucoma, or retinal diseases, or corneal and ocular surface disease, or refractive conditions. We continuously strive to reinvest in our future and offer an ever-growing portfolio of effective and affordable treatment options for a better tomorrow. I can't emphasize also enough the importance of our relationship with you and our collaboration with eye care professionals. We embrace our partnership with you and our shared goal of improving the quality of life of your patients. If you have any feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and share it with us. But thank you for all that you do for the eye care profession and take care. Welcome back as we continue the conversation with Dr. Pedram Hamra and Anakalor. You talked about mixed disease, perhaps, no susceptive and neuropathic maybe together, but can you also have patients that are both neuropathic and neurotrophic? And can you have a neurotrophic patient that still might score 25 on a speed questionnaire? Right. So I think the prototypical disease that we're all comfortable with is diabetes. And we know people have peripheral diabetic neuropathy where you can't feel a needle going in, but you have burning and tingling at night that keeps you up. And so that's super, super common, but the same thing can happen in the eye. You can have patients who, when you check their sensation, it's decreased, but they still complain of pain in various forms. And so I think that absolutely. And that makes it, as Pedram said, it's a complex condition and patients are complex and you can have neurotrophic keratitis in isolation without pain, or you can have neurotrophic keratitis and neuropathic pain coexisting in the same patient, just like you can have painful diabetic neuropathy. And I made a mistake on a patient like that recently who drove three hours from Los Angeles to see me, who had a lot of symptoms and was post-LASIK and some other conditions. And I did the preparacane challenge. And then I realized I probably should have tested his corneal sensitivity. So I made him go to lunch and come back. And sure enough, he had reduced sensitivity in the cornea an hour later. And I have had patients who have treated for neurotrophic keratitis who've actually had an improvement in their symptom questionnaire. So that's not how I would have intuitively thought about that. So you think that sensation, still some abnormal firing from the corneal nerves. Do you think the lids can play a role in any of that? So, and we wrote about this in our report. We know a lot less about the innervation of the conjunctiva and the eyelids. And so we definitely know that the lids contribute to anatomical issues, right? So we're always looking for nocturnal lag of thalmos or conjunctival cholesis or incomplete blink or absent blink in patients with Parkinson's disease. We know that the eyelids are an integral part of keeping our ocular surface healthy, but the actual innervation to the eyelids, my guess would be yes, but we just don't know as much as we do about eyelid innervation as we do about corneal innervation. So a patient gets cataract surgery. I don't want to pick on any particular surgery, but they get a surgery, an ophthalmic surgery, and it causes some harm to a nerve. Do we know what might cause a nerve to go neuropathic or neurotrophic? Do we know anything about that mechanism, which decides which way that may go? I think this is an important conversation in general because people always thought that neurotrophic and neuropathic are mutually exclusive, but they're not. I'm happy to be having this conversation because that can be, as I not said, the case, like in shingles patients. But according to your question, I think neuro- neuropathic requires two components. It requires nerve damage, which a surgical incision can provide, and it requires chronic inflammation, which in many cases 
uh, where this neuropathic develops, uh, the most likely explanation is that the inflammation hasn't subsided or rebounds after the taper of the initial steroids that are occurring. And so many of these post-surgical cases, like when we do confocal, we see there's a lot of inflammation still being present. And interestingly, as Anat was alluding to, many of these cases end up having some kind of sort of autoimmune disorder. So basically the nerve damage, which is surgically induced or through other reasons, and the chronic inflammation typically are required to develop neuropathic pain. In terms of neurotrophic, it's usually damage to the nerves for any reason. It could be trauma, surgery, or, but it also can be persistent inflammation. As an example, like in a Schurgen's patient where you have chronic inflammation, where you have nerve retraction or nerve degeneration, which occurs at the trigeminal level, and the pain itself can result in nerve retraction itself. When you have pain, the nerves start to retract and the patients can have decreased nerve density. But typically, it's some kind of a trauma or systemic disorder like diabetes, small fiber neuropathy, et cetera. When should practitioners be thinking about testing corneal sensitivity? And I want to piggyback on that, Pedram. You mentioned about autoimmune and combined with some sort of ophthalmic surgery. Should surgeons be extending the anti-inflammatory topical therapy longer in those patients or be, how should they approach them differently? I think if the patient has a history of autoimmune disorder or is prone to inflammation, I mean, I typically screen for that even through a small uh, short screen, uh, serial serology screen. If you extend the taper over two to three months rather than one month, it's much safer in my, in my experience. I have operated on many patients who had improved on the neuropathic pain and resolved and have done the surgeries myself and haven't seen it recur in these cases. Although before I was doing my tapers on a regular, like two to four weeks taper, I'd seen these patients do develop pain again after surgery. Similar for you or not? I think in general, because I also have a uveitis practice, I do like slow tapers in patients that have known autoimmune prolonged inflammatory conditions. And so again, my show grants, my graft versus host, anyone with a history of uveitis, autoimmune disease, I tend, especially after cataract surgery, which is the main surgery I do on these patients, I tend to do a slow taper. I have to say I haven't tested it as robustly as Pedram, so I don't know what would have happened if I would have tapered slowly. What does your follow-up look like on those patients, Pedram, after uh, the slow taper or during the slow taper, post-surgically? I, I mean, the follow-up is initially like typical, like the one day, one week, one month. But then at the one month, if I'm suspicious, I do a confocal to confirm whether there is inflammation or not. But if, if I continue on a taper, I probably haven't come back at eight to 12 weeks before I stop the steroids, depending on if I do an eight-week or 12-week taper. I typically do like a eight-week taper initially. And then in some of these, I have a tail where I even go to twice a week before I stop unless I'm super confident that I can stop at eight weeks on, on, on that level. Other than, other than checking IOPs, is there something else that you're looking for on that exam? I do do the hypersensitivity testing with a hyperosmolar solution to see if the nerves are sensitizing or not. In most cases, they're not. If they are, I may do a confocal, but if you use, if you use a hyperosmolar test, you can see if they're hypersensitivity or not. And if, if the discomfort level goes up by one or two notches, for me, that's an indication of continuing the taper. That takes us 20 seconds, actually, to do for a clinician. Can you explain that, how you do that? I take a bottle of Muro 128, which is 5% sodium chloride. I ask the symptoms before. I apply it in each eye. I wait 20 seconds only. Ask them again if the pain has gone up or is developed by two or more. For me, that's a sign of hypersensitivity because... That's how it was done initially in, in, in the preclinical studies by providing hyperosmolar solution, which triggers the nociceptors in the nerves. I was saying, I can just see it all across the internet, minds exploding when people are just now getting comfortable with neuropathic or neurotrophic, but both, you know, one person, you know, I'm talking about com complex, A, to how to diagnose that, but also how to treat that. And of course, uh, you would, the issue of nerve growth factor comes up, which of course is FDA approved for neurotrophic keratitis, but in a patient who has both components of neuropathic and neurotrophic, how do you balance that treatment to improve sensation, but not, but also decrease sensation at the same time? 
And does NGF have a role in those patients or not? Would it make it worse? So actually taking a step back, we actually don't know what NGF is doing and whether it's actually impacting nerves because, you know, nerves and epithelial cells talk to each other all the time. And we see that all the time when zoster happens and the nerves go away and the epithelium breaks down if you look at it the wrong way, right? And so these epithelial cells need these growth factors to sustain them. It's not just NGF, it's platelet-derived growth factor. And so one thought is that NGF is actually a growth factor for epithelial cell health. So it could be that that is what's at play, but we do know that NGF is a component, both potentially helping patients with neurotrophic keratitis, potentially making neuropathic pain worse, although there are some signals that in certain patients, maybe at a different dose than what we're giving now, it can actually help. And so I think that the answer is a definite maybe, (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> I think there is excitement about various growth factors, NGF and others, in ocular surface diseases. And now the key is finding the right patient for that treatment. The head exploding, Chris, is not that far-fetched because if you thought about dry 10 years ago, it was aqueous deficient or evaporative, right? Yep. Nobody thought it's combined. But yep. now if you look at the last dues, it's all mixed. So it's basically neither one or the other, but all it's, everything is mixed. And so it's basically the same here. You have nerve hypersensitivity and lack of neurotrophic. It's basically a chemical imbalance by the nervous system in the end. At Arvo, which is next week, we have a poster where we did a preclinical study with NGF on neuropathic mm-hmm. animals, and we showed that there was significant improvement. Although previous studies by like Genentech and diabetics were terminated because there was increased pain. So it's kind of tricky because NGF can inc- increase discomfort in neurotrophic patients. But on the other hand, the preclinical, preclinical data shows it also relieves the pain uh, at least after the treatment period. So the question as Anat was raising is do we need a different concentration, frequency? Can the same frequency be applied in patients? So those are a lot of unknowns. You know, you mentioned, Chris, about making neuropathic pain worse or, I mean, decreasing and increasing sensation at the same time, but perhaps more of a normalization. Right. The nervous That's the key. System, right. And, and NGF potentially has a, a chance to, to do that. Right. And that would be pretty exciting. And well, let, let's use the TFOS terminology, restoring homeostasis. I love that. <laughs> it's very called, sexy. That's why it's called restasis. <laughs> Does neuropathic pain and neurotrophic keratitis even belong in, in the dry category? I mean, it's a different disease entity, right? The, the nerves play a role in terms of tear production and homeostasis, et cetera. But when they go haywire, it's not really dry eye syndrome anymore. It's not really dry eye anymore, right? It's something completely different. Well, the problem is, it's, is it the chicken or the egg? By the time you see the patient, they've got both the tear problem and a nerve problem. And, you know, sometimes it's really nice. They are 30, they had a surgery, and now they have pain, and their tear parameters are perfect. You can feel pretty confident saying, I think there's a neuropathic component. But I'll tell you, my 60 and 70-year-olds, they all have both because these things don't exist in isolation. Remember, it's a dynamic system. You don't have good sensation. You're lacrimal gland or my bobian glands aren't going to respond appropriately. And that's going to cause more issues on the ocular surface. And that's going to create inflammation that we know then sensitizes nerves. And it's a cycle, you know, so we already had the vicious cycle of dry eye. Now add the vicious cycle of nerve dysfunction and tear parameter abnormalities, and they feed on each other. And so by the time you see a patient, you don't necessarily, I wish my patients sometimes had like the nice natural history of animal models, because It's not as clean when you've had something going on for a few years and you get to see them at this one snapshot of time where they have lots and lots of different abnormalities. We just have to acknowledge that reality and figure out how do we dissect the pieces so we can figure out how to deliver precision medicine to an individual patient. So I think that's where we're going. Hey, Pedro, for for doctors or practitioners who are uncomfortable, so you do prepare a can challenge and pain doesn't budge and and you think you're dealing with something centrally located ganglion, trigeminal ganglia, perhaps, who should these practitioners be referring their patients to if they don't want to go pain management on their own? Should it be pain management or somebody else? Or how, what's the best way to approach that? It's a complicated question, but I mean, most cornea specialists treat shingles and zoster with, with the same medications. And so, but when it comes to neuropathic and it's not herpetic, they're not comfortable. So they try to try to send to pain management and neurology. Neurologists have the oh, it's all dry eyes. They send them back to ophthalmology. 
And so that's the problem with dry eye disease because it's kind of a misnomer. It's actually ocular surface disease, which are like better than dry eye because most of these patients are not really dry. But yeah, it's challenging. I mean, in some clinics, neurology can take care of it. In some, in some places, uh, pain management does take care of it. In some places, the primary care ends up doing. The patients take the articles and just go to them. But once you've treated half a dozen of these cases and get comfortable with it, I think many ophthalmologists should be able to treat these cases. And some optometrists may be able to, depending if they can prescribe oral medications or not. But it's tricky because you have to develop your network locally and to work with neurology or pain clinic. And I've did, done it locally as well. So kind of, I try, I try myself first to first four or five drugs, but I have neurologists who I work with together, who I give lectures or they give lectures to me. And we kind of talk about these cases and we understand the case and eventually and, and, the, and the dynamics and we decide together, should I do it now? Or should I send it to you at this point? And they do the same. They have a lot of neurological patients who have ended up being having dry or other things who they send up to us. And so you can develop these referral patterns uh, with somebody who you're comfortable with in the patient's best interest in the end. So I don't think there's a clear one or golden bullet answer to send them to person X because it all depends who's living in your town, who's comfortable treating these patients. Chris, like we said, we could go on for hours on this. Yeah. We should probably wrap it up. That was yeah. That so, was um, a non pedram if you wouldn't mind just sharing your cell phone so doctors can text you with or call you with any questions <laughs> at any time. Do <laughs> <laughs> already. Yeah, I'm sure that might keep you pretty busy, Chris. Anything else from you? I, I could. I have a million more questions, but I want to re be respectful of your time. No, I mean I have a million too, and we could talk for another two or three hours, but uh, we'll spare everybody and, and wrap it up. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. We really appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Join us for our next episode soon. Find us online at www.ocularsurfaceacademy.com, all major podcast platforms, and YouTube. For over 18 years, iEco has been an industry leader of natural, effective, at-home dry eye management. From our line of tea tree eyelid cleansers and patented controlled moist heat compresses to our nighttime hydrating masks and daytime moisture chambers, we support you and your patients with scientifically proven products for mild, moderate, and severe dry eye. Join us today to experience the iEco difference at iEco.com. That's E-Y-E-E-C-O.com.